Okay, look, I hate to comment on a video before even greeting the host, but this shit is rated G. If anything should be rated R, this should. Welcome to creation in the 21st century. I'm your host, Carl Ball, founder and director of the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. I knew it was evidence, not evidences, that jackass Pendleton said it was the Creation Evidences Museum. Oh well, you know what? Let's not talk about him. I don't have to deal with him today. I'm honestly just glad to have one video where I don't have to look at that guy's dopey mug. Today we have a most unusual program for you, titled Trampled by Dinosaurs. It's another Flintstones video? Seriously? You know, I can only take so much of this. And we're going to discuss that today with a very competent guest of mine who has trekked in search of unusual creatures and has a very fine academic background. A guest? I didn't know you had guests on here. I thought I was just going to be debunking you, but... Yeah, I suppose if there's an expert who's more qualified to speak on the matter, it's better that you have him as a guest than try to explain his points for him. And this guy does sound like he's pretty qualified, so who is it? Would you welcome for Trampled by Dinosaurs, welcome to the discussion today, my good friend, Professor John Pendleton, chemist. Professor, it's a delight to have you with us today. Carl, it's just great to be here. I'm excited. <laughs> okay, okay. Get it together, Logic. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm all right. No, it's okay. It's okay. No, I'll deal with it. He's not a fucking professor! Uh, yes, well, follow me, because we're talking uh, with an academic today. He's a dumb fuck with a bachelor's degree and a job as an auto mechanic. I have a bachelor's degree. Do you know how difficult it was to get? It was harder to get my fucking driver's license. Not only do you not have an advanced degree, John, you don't have a job as a fucking academic. Carl, he's an auto mechanic. So unless he's here to talk about the finer details of fixing an engine, I really don't see how you expect anyone to take this shit seriously. You are representative for the Institute for Creation Research, which is the premier uh, science advisory research program among creationists. Oh yeah, I forgot that creationists have a different dictionary than we do. It's just a different dialect of English where professor and academic and science and research actually don't mean anything. So I guess I can't get too mad. I love you very much. Yo lo amo mucho a usted. Oh, isn't that sweet? Now I understand why you two seem so close. And that was very kind of you, Carl, to also say it in Spanish, because clearly John doesn't understand English. Now, before we get to being trampled by dinosaurs, John, you have an academic background. In fact, I understand in your undergraduate work as a chemist, you were part of a research program having to do with cancer, That's is that right. right? That's correct. I worked uh, with the Cancer Research Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For a year. And then you went and became an auto mechanic for the rest of your life. You know, the argument from authority is one thing, but inventing authority, talking about it for the first five minutes of your show, and acting like that means something, that takes some serious cojones, amigo. We're also in... Uh, finished my studies in chemistry. I've also learned automotive technician. Uh, that's applied science. Don't take my word for it, folks. He just told you everything I've told you. Anyway, are you serious, John? Trying to justify being an auto mechanic by saying it's applied science? Even you are better than that. Oh, yes. And, and on, on the <clears throat> field where you go, and the fields where you go, right. uh, that's of more importance than a degree. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Allow me to paraphrase what just happened. Carl just realized, oh shit, John just told everyone he has no serious academic training or experience at all and the only thing he's ever been good at is being an auto mechanic. Quick, talk about his experience in the field. That's way more important. John replies with a desperate, exactly, exactly, while his internal monologue is thinking, oh thank you Carl for trying to make me look like less of an imbecile. So I was fixing things or learning how to fix things or telling others how to fix them. Plus, I'm also a mid-husband six times. I only have one client, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> okay, marvelous. So that's applied marvelous. science also. Yes, it is. Am I even going to need a commentary on this video? Maybe I should just stop right here and mirror it uncut on my own channel. 
It seems to be doing my work for me. I'm a respectable scientist because I'm a mid-husband, and that's applied science. If that makes you a scientist, you might as well say some dude jerking off in his basement is a scientist because he's got to figure out how best to get himself off. Well, we're talking about dinosaurs. Well, that was a train wreck. Quick, let's move on to the main topic. Our generation has been often educated out of the truth. I can tell that's never been a problem for you two. You have information. I mean, actual scientific information as a professor in a scientific discipline that contradicts that evolutionary theory. Is that right? Right. We have real live witnesses in central Mexico of having seen living dinosaurs, mainly of the flying nature. Let's talk about, in fact, I think we're, we're discussing pterodactyls here. What makes you think that? He said flying dinosaurs. If anything, that makes me think of a stegosaurus on a hang glider. Now let's go on with your accurate reports of living pterodactyls. Well, I've had a contact, I live in central Mexico, and I've had witnesses over the last five years. Uh, one is a, uh, a Wichol Indian. Uh, he's a Christian man, uh, used to live in the mountains of the state of Jalisco, and he told me in 1998 that he saw dead in a river a large winged creature, did not have feathers, and so when I finally got a book of pterosaurs, that's flying dinosaurs, yes. I said, look through, it's a big book, it's got pictures of fossils and people that studied these things, finally came to one, it's not at all like this one, it's quite different, uh, maybe we can show a picture later that we yes. have here of him, but it was a large, it was about two and a half, well, two and a half to three meters, let's see, that's about an eight to ten foot wingspan. And he said he crossed this stream a number of times, other people saw him. I said, why didn't you pick it up? It was worth a million dollars. But eventually it just corroded and the stream oh, washed yes. it away. Yes. Some guy said he saw a pterosaur is not evidence that pterosaurs still exist. I'm sorry. There's lots of people who absolutely swear that they've seen Bigfoot, or aliens, or the Loch Ness Monster, or God. Somebody telling you that they saw something is not evidence. And you telling us that somebody else told you that they saw something is definitely not evidence. On an unrelated note, um, I have a friend who says that they saw you raping your mother. So according to you, I have hard evidence that you raped your mother. If you reject this evidence, it's just you being hard-headed. So come on, admit it. Then, um, three years ago, three years ago um, I, was, uh, give, I gave a debate. By the way, I've won all the debates I've had. I've had 11 oh, of I them. Certainly, the truth wins yeah, debates. It, it, it's really kind of unfair, you know, but anyway. We, we're <laughs> armed with the truth. You won every debate you've ever had. You. Yeah, I could only believe that if you were debating the mental equivalent of this. With or without the Bible, and it's all consistent with the Bible, we have the academic truth that can be verified. Exactly. Wow, cool. Yeah. Hey, Carl, um, if that academic truth can be so easily verified, why don't you let people actually verify all those little pieces of evidence that you've collected over the years, instead of locking them away in your creation evidence museum or other places? It seems like that would be a really good idea to actually get that evidence verified, get your academic truth established, and prove that the Bible is completely scientifically accurate. What a glorious thing that would be to do in God's name. As a matter of fact, it seems a little bit blasphemous for you not to do that, don't you think? I can't help but wonder why you don't. There must be a reason, but I honestly just can't think of what it might be. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, and so I gave follow-up talks from this uh, debate, figuring people would be interested in more things, and I gave on dinosaurs, and I mentioned about sightings of pterodactyls, and a lady from my church raised her hand and says, then it's true. I said, what's true? She says, my husband saw one. I says, really? He, his son, companion, 12 passengers saw a something like this. All right. Gliding was about uh, 17 to 20 foot wingspan. 17 to 20 foot wingspan. Right. About only 60 feet from his bus. On the same level as they were. Once again, someone told me they saw a pterodactyl does not mean that they saw a pterodactyl. Also, I kind of find it funny that you say nothing about trying to find and talk to the other 12 people who were supposedly on this bus. 
No, let's just take the word of this guy who was in my church and heard me say that dinosaurs are proof of creationism. Yeah, we don't need to verify anything he says, because nobody who goes to church would ever break the Ninth Commandment. Now, just uh, a, a few months ago, I met a person just in conversation, and we're talking about this, and she said, oh, by my village, people have lost animals, um, goats, sheep, male sheep that weigh up to 100 pounds, and of course, the it's astounding. Animals got eaten by another animal? And they weighed up to a hundred pounds? Whoa, pterodactyls have to still exist. Or maybe it was a swallow. No, I guess a swallow couldn't do that. European or African. And so there's been a number of sightings. The thing is that I'm excited about this is because it's been like, you know, every month, every two months, there's a lost animal, uh, a goat without a head on it, you know, or just the, the skin is left, the animal's been eaten. And, uh, and so there's been a yeah. number of sightings, so... You ever heard of a jaguar, or a wolf, or a bear? The fact that you found an animal killed and eaten every month or two does not cause an intelligent person to immediately assume that it's a 20-foot pterosaur. John, this is so exciting because I'm sure you know that I've led three scientific expeditions into the jungles of Papua New Guinea mm -hmm. in search of living pterodactyls because we have at least a dozen eyewitness accounts similar to those that you're relating now. Mm. Uh, so we're being trampled by, <laughs> overcome by, pterodactyls. Exactly. Check out the link in the description of Bigfoot sightings by state. If we're being trampled by pterosaurs because of 12 eyewitness accounts, we must be fucking infested with Bigfoots. We need to start a campaign to start weeding those things out, because apparently they're the dominant force in our ecosystem. Now, uh, as you proceed with this investigation, uh, I, I want to want to give you. I want to have you back on the program. Oh, so, uh, so please be careful. Oh, definitely. Because the background research that we have indicates that sometime these flying creatures mm -hmm. that have been seen uh, in three or four different countries with verified uh, reputable individuals having made the sightings. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Didn't you say it was just some dude you met randomly? And some other dude that just happened to be in church with you, and his kid, and some villagers who said that their animals had been eaten by something. These might be very nice, very trustworthy people. They might think they saw something. They might even have seen something. But that does not make them reputable sources for these kind of claims. Even the most reputable scientist would not be a reputable source for this claim, because nobody can be without evidence. Now the guy who saw the thing in the river, if he wanted to fish it out of the river and have an actual body of a creature, that's a different thing, because at least then you have something physical that you can investigate. Stories from random people who you've already been talking to about pterodactyls exist, telling you, hey, I saw a big flying critter one time, that does not back up your claim even a little. When they get close to them, quite often their, uh, their breath is quite toxic, in fact, individuals have been known to die from inhaling the fumes, mm. so be very, very careful. I would love to see that coroner's report. Do you have a copy of it? The one that explicitly says died by toxic pterosaur breath? Now, I understand that you not only want to cite one, tell us what you actually want to do. Well, actually, what we're doing right now is uh, I'll be doing more visits to this particular village. Uh, it's in central Mexico. Obviously, I can't reveal more at this time. By at this time, you mean at any time, right? Yeah, I know how you work. But it's interesting because this whole area is sort of a high plain area. Okay. But, um, and you know this too, is the pterodactyls are nocturnal. Yes. And so that's why they're not seen very often. Fly at night is a And room, also, exceptions. right, and they don't like uh, light. That's correct. They don't like humans. And they tend to live either in very deep caves or abandoned mines. Yeah, and you never see the giants because they live in a palace in the clouds, and you never see the Bigfoots because they're trans-dimensional beings who use trees as portals, and you never see the reptoids because they transform into politicians. Yeah, we get it, dude. But hey, at least you said that they're caves and mines, and they have to be fairly large because these pterosaurs you're talking about are creatures with 20-foot wingspans, so a person could fit in there. Since you seem to know for a fact that they live in these caves and mines, you must know which caves and mines they are because otherwise you would have no idea where they live. So why don't you tell us what caves and mines they are so that we can actually go and investigate them. Get a search team down there to search for these 20-foot-wide, toxic-breath-spewing pterosaurs. 
And so in central Mexico, we have a lot of mining, and there are mines that get mined as long as there's mineral, and then the shafts are sure. just left. And so uh, I really think that we have some good ideas where they could be at, but our idea is to build, quote, a feeding area that will fence off so they can get into, but other animals won't get into. You're going to build a fenced off area that a giant reptile with a 20 foot wingspan can get into, but no other animals can. Good luck with that. And uh, we're mounting two infrared cameras that will take pictures or up to a 10 second video. So if anything comes, it's, it's motion activated. Now our idea is to get a tranquilizer gun and uh, tranquilize it, mount a radio transmitter and it's going to be the hardest thing for me to do mm. is to let it go. To let it you're going to you're assuming that you, you do you actually believe that 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 I I think you broke my brain. And we'll take maybe a few blood samples quickly. You're being a chemist. Right. And uh, we'll get these out to some of the Christian scientist uh, creation scientist groups yes. that we know so they can do a different independent analysis. It's a pretty big creature. Why don't you just take like a whole bucket of blood and send it to more than just the creation scientists? I'm sure the real scientists would also really appreciate knowing about it. But the thing is, we want it to go and tell us where the family is. I, I'm kind of greedy. I don't want one pterodactyl. I want the whole family. Well, for preservation of the species exactly. and scientific continue. analysis. It's like a couple little kids planning an imaginary adventure. And then, and then, we find a wolf, and it becomes our friend, and then, and then it takes us back to its home in a cave, and there's a whole family of wolves, and, and they're gonna bite us, and, and we're gonna become werewolves, and then we'll, we'll go and fight, fight all the vampires. It's gonna be cool. Now, this is so incredibly intriguing. <laughs> intriguing is not the word that I would use to describe what this is. Well, let's, Carl, let's, let me say before I forget, yeah. I want our viewers to be praying about this. I, I, th because here's the thing. God made them. God should get the glory. And yes. that's, that's what my goal is, okay? That and when you fail miserably, you want to say, oh, well, God just didn't answer the prayers. Not only would God get the glory of your success, he'll get the blame for your inevitable abject failure. Now, the concept of the program today is that we're being trampled by dinosaurs and the academic community, unfortunately, and you, you have been and still are a part of the academic community, and I have certain credentials. Right. Yeah, John's still a member of the academic community in the field of applied science. And there's a link in the description to an interesting article on Carl Baugh's so-called credentials. But what we believe and what we've experienced is cross-grain with the standard academic profile. The standard profile is that these creatures died out 64 million years ago, and uh, here we are with only fossilized remnants, but you are finding actual scientific sighting evidence, right. and you plan to have a specimen to examine. A whole family. A whole family. I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of greedy, but... <laughs> John, your greed is not really the main problem with that plan. Now, let me ask you a special favor, my friend. Before you turn him loose, will you call some of us and let us fly down and at least duplicate the eyewitness account for verification before you turn him loose? To verify the eyewitness account so you don't plan to have a video camera. Isn't that a bit of a problem? You're just going to catch it and go, wow, we actually caught a fucking pterosaur. And then you're just going to have eyewitness accounts that you actually caught a pterosaur. And then you're going to take your blood samples and send them exclusively to the fucking Institute of Creation Research and whatever else, ignoring the scientific community completely. You're not going to send it to the media so that they can send it to independent labs for verification. What baffles me here is that I'm sure that you know that you're not actually going to catch anything, but even so, you're not even pretending that you're going to be honest if you do. Well, I don't know if I can keep them anesthetized that long. Uh, okay, that's. Uh, uh, I understand that's sort of a thing that you need to be careful with because. Yes. So. So you'll do the best you can. We'll do at, what we can. At least you'll have local witnesses, and, and yeah, a, we're going to definitely of... be videotaping uh, those occurrences. Okay, so you are actually going to be videotaping. You know, for the first time ever, John, I feel like you actually just bitch slapped someone with logic. Carl's going on. Oh, you, so you make sure that you have local witnesses, right? And John, you're like. Uh, we're gonna videotape it. But let's emphasize the fact that we have an academic profile that by the new uh, parameters defining science actually rules out 
with these parameters in the definition of science rules out any supernatural agency as having designed or created any of the universe, let alone the living systems. The fact that there's zero evidence in support of a supernatural agency does not rule out a supernatural agency. If you can actually gather conclusive evidence that a supernatural agency was responsible for the creation of the universe and all life within it, then that would become the scientific explanation. However, you fail at every turn to provide any convincing evidence. Let's take this video as an example. You talk amongst yourselves as though you've totally provided evidence, but as a matter of fact, I'm not even rejecting evidence you've presented. You've presented no evidence. Yet we have an incredible pyramid of evidence. Yes, an incredible pyramid of evidence. I think we need to make a clarification, you know. They've always thrown at us that we can't allow creation in the schools because that's religion. Mm -hmm. Do you know that atheism is religion? Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. All right, what do you got? I believe in God, you believe in God. They don't believe in God, but that's their religion. They believe, they believe there is no God. They believe in materialism. They believe in naturalism. They believe in evolution. What are they always saying? We believe. Okay, it's a religion. I believe that if I took a knife and stabbed myself repeatedly in both ears that I didn't have to listen to you anymore, I would become deaf. This is a belief. I am persuaded of the truth of this because I understand what happens if I take a knife and stab myself in the ears. It damages the parts of my ears that I need to be able to hear. It's been tested and confirmed many times. That's why I believe it. This is not a religious belief. I also believe that if I jumped off my fourth floor balcony right now in despair at how stupid some members of the human species are, my head would be split open on the sidewalk. Again, not a religious belief. These are beliefs based on observation of reality. If every belief were considered to be religious, we could do away with either the word religion or the word belief because they would mean exactly the same thing. But guess what? They don't. Beliefs based on observation of reality, like that stabbing myself in the ears will deafen me, or that species change over time, are not religious beliefs. If we had just took all the, all the chemicals that make up a living cell, we had little piles of them, Yes. You know what happened to them in this atmosphere? Oh. They would oxidize or hydrolyze. They'd combine with water. It, they would be useless. A and they would dissolve. It, that's, just, that's if you could even make them by chance. Okay, look, dude, I'm not here to argue abiogenesis with you, because we're talking about evolution. The two have nothing to do with each other. It's kind of like this deistic argument, well, God must have started the universe in the first place. Fine, I mean, if you want to believe that, go believe that God kicked off the Big Bang. How the Big Bang started doesn't affect what happened after it started. Abiogenesis doesn't affect evolution by natural selection any more than the Big Bang affected the evolution of the universe from that point forward. Now the correct answer when it comes to whether an intelligence was involved in the creation of the very first life form is I don't know. Because at this point, nobody knows. But if you want to be intellectually dishonest and say, I know for a fact that Magic Man did it, then fine. I'm perfectly happy to let you say that and I'm not going to argue with you. So now we have a little strand of protein in the ocean created by Magic Man. Now can we please resume our conversation about the time between that and modern organisms? In addition to that, Nobel Laureate Wald uh, of uh, a major facility of Yale University said he chose not to believe in God as the originator of living systems, even though he recognized that scientifically it was impossible for living systems to have evolved. Link in the description to how George Wald was quote-mined on this, but I just skimmed it because, honestly, it doesn't matter. Once again, this isn't about evolution. You say George Wald was talking about abiogenesis. And then you go on to say that because according to you he is unconvinced of abiogenesis, he also believes that it is impossible for life to have evolved, when in fact his quotes say nothing whatsoever about evolution. Do you see the flaw there? When he talks about abiogenesis and you say, well, therefore, he disbelieves that evolution is possible. No matter how much you think they are or wish they were, the two are not linked in any way. Now, with your breach of the Ninth Commandment out of the way, even if he had said what you claim he said, it would do nothing to strengthen your argument because George Wall does not dictate the beliefs of other atheists and scientists. How are we being brainwashed? There's basically two ways. It's very simple. One is they do not give us all of the information. If you have Correct. incomplete information, you can't make good decisions. Wow. 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 The hypocrisy that you just displayed blows my fucking mind. 
I'm sure a lot of people watching this have seen my Hello I'm a Scientist series, where you, John, make claim after claim after claim after claim without any sources, any details, any of even the most basic information. All you say is, I have evidence, you should believe I have evidence, but I'm not going to tell you about my evidence. And you go and complain about people brainwashing you by not giving you all the information. How do you live with yourself? And it's amazing, as I give my creation science talks in English and Spanish, people, the, if I hear anything common, it's this, why haven't we heard this before? That's correct. Oh, I get it now. When you say they're not giving you all the information, what you really mean is, they're not giving you the false information that you want to hear. They're not making up claims like you do every single day and force-feeding them to you. Instead, they're actually doing science, producing papers in excruciating detail, reproducing their results, forming a complete, consistent picture of how things work, and not pandering to thick-skulled morons who believe every fucking fairy tale they're told. Um, and the other thing is they just keep repeating, repeating, repeating. This evolved into that in millions of years, both of which are not science. We've never observed anything evolve into anything different than what it is. Yes, we have, but because you draw this arbitrary distinction between microevolution and macroevolution and don't seem to understand that there is no difference, you don't understand that. You, John, yourself, said, and I'm going to put the clip here. Now, you might have varieties of dogs, Certainly. but what are they? Dogs. Certainly. You know, we have varieties of cats. What are they, cats? We do see variation within species. What you fail to understand is, any variation is evolution. There is no microevolution or macroevolution. So-called microevolution, over and over and over and over and over again, eventually makes something that looks pretty different from what it used to be. We examine firsthand the fossil record, living systems. I work in doing this. John works in doing this. As we examine this, we recognize there is a creator. We know him. And we want you to know that creator. There it is, folks. All of this pretense of just wanting to teach you true science. No, what they want is to get you in their club. He visited planet Earth almost 2,000 years ago. He walked our streets, sat in our councils, took our children, loved them to himself. Ah, uh, do you really want to accuse Jesus of being a child molester? Although, I, I guess that would explain why the Catholic Church doesn't do anything about child molesting priests. Took us and offered us hope. Went to Calvary. Died on the cross for our sins. Was placed in an empty tomb. Occupied it. Rose from the dead. And left the tomb empty again. He's ascended to heaven. Promised he would return. And at this moment, in his universal dimension, he is knocking at your heart's door. It's funny, you know. For the other claims in here, you at least seemed to care if there was evidence presented. Your testimonial bullshit wasn't evidence, but at least you tried. This claim, though, this massive, bizarre, fantasy story claim, is the one that you've chosen not to try to back up even a little bit. You just expect your audience to believe that all that shit actually happened. And yeah, I know, your audience already believes it. That's not really my point. And that is it. Carl Baugh, you barely did anything in that whole video. It ended up being another John Morris Pendleton video, and I am not happy about it. The next time I encounter you, Carl, you better not have that dimwit with you. I want to talk to you.